Today on Newswatch, fighting terror. See how authorities in Belgium are working to round up the Islamic militants responsible for this week's attack in Brussels. Plus, are you noticing more women than men on your church pews on Sunday? A new study reveals there is a reason. We'll break down the research. And intervening for China will show you how Chinese Christians are praying for their country as the government goes through major changes. And thank you so much for joining us for CBN News Watch. I'm Ephraim Graham. Authorities in Brussels have detained at least six people in raids connected with Tuesday's attacks. The news comes as pressure mounts on the Belgian government to beef up security and avoid mistakes that may have led to this week's tragedy. Belgian police carried out overnight raids in neighborhoods where earlier this week they found explosives and bomb making materials. They arrested at least six people. They're trying to determine if the terrorists had other potential targets. In France, a counterterrorism raid has prevented a new terrorist attack. Officials arrested a suspect in the advanced stages of planning. And authorities have now formally linked the Paris and the Brussels attacks. They believe the same Islamic State cell carried out both. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry arrived in Brussels today for counterterrorism talks. The Belgian government is facing growing criticism amidst evidence it missed a number of signs pointing to the attack. The Dutch government now says one of the Brussels suicide bombers flew from Turkey to Amsterdam in July. But it says Turkish authorities never warned he was a known foreign terrorist fighter. Such mistakes are a big reason some European ministers want an agreement that will allow countries to share passenger data but privacy advocates oppose such plans. A manhunt is still underway for one of the Brussels airport attackers who was recorded on surveillance video. And the families of the missing are still searching for their loved ones. Every one of them heartbreaking and difficult for these families. They want uh, information about their loved ones who are missing. While Belgian security officials hunt for those responsible for the terror attacks, the people of Brussels have been grieving at a makeshift memorial. Chris Mitchell reports now from the site where the people of the city have come to remember the victims. Chris. This is the Place de la Bousse. Actually, it's a Belgium stock exchange, and it's the latest place where people have gathered to commemorate the victims of Tuesday's terror attack. You can see here the whole place is uh, the whole plaza is just surrounded by the world's media. You can see CNN, BBC, Al Jazeera, many people from around the world, which is just indicative of how important this story is. Over here, you can see the flowers, the candles, the flags that people have brought to commemorate the victims. Uh, it's the latest terror attack here in Europe, but many people are concerned it won't be the last. Uh, some of the accomplices are still at large, uh, and they're searching, uh, searching for them even now. And just, just a few blocks away from here, about a 10-minute ride, is Molenbeek, which is the, the scene of many of these uh, people that have committed some of these attacks. And you can also see some of the flags here. The Israeli flag is here. And uh, it's a rainy day here in Brussels, and it's sort of indicative of the somber mood of many of the people. Uh, this terror attack has really shaken the people of Belgium and the people of Europe, and uh, they wonder when the next terror attack may be. We'll have more on coming up on CBN News and the 700 Club on Monday. But for now, this is Chris Mitchell at the Place de la Bourse in Brussels, Belgium. Chris, thank you. The Justice Department has charged seven hackers with ties to the Iranian government. They're accused of cyber attacks on dozens of banks and a small dam outside New York City. The attorney general described the attacks as relentless, systematic and widespread. One hacker repeatedly gained access to the control system of the Bowman Avenue Dam, but the dam's gate had been disconnected for maintenance at the time. None of the suspects is in American custody, and the U.S. does not have an extradition treaty with Iran, but the case sends a warning that mouse clicks can be traced even far outside the country. Indiana is now the second state to pass a law that protects babies with fetal birth defects from abortion. Governor Mike Pence signed the bill into law and called it, quote, a measure that affirms the value of all human life. The bill also prohibits abortions on the basis of a child's race, sex or ancestry. Opponents say the law is about violating women's rights, but the governor says it is about protecting society's most vulnerable. Under the law, doctors who perform forbidden abortions could be sued for wrongful death. 
The NFL has come out against Georgia's religious exemptions bill, stating it could impact Atlanta's consideration in the Super Bowl selection process. Disney, Marvel, AMC, and some Hollywood actors and producers have also threatened to boycott the state. The bill does not affect businesses, only religious organizations. I hope that these companies and these um, CEOs of these giant organizations will take the time to read the bill and look at what's happened in the other 21 countries that have passed same-sex laws. It has um, uh, squelched the First Amendment rights of many of those citizens, and we're trying to protect that here in Georgia. I mean, we're trying to be fair and equitable. Evangelist Franklin Graham has called out the NFL, stating the bill is simply a protection for pastors and does not legalize discrimination. North Carolina's Governor Pat McCrory has signed a bill that will repeal Charlotte's transgender bathroom ordinance. The measure was passed earlier this month, and it would have allowed transgender people to use public bathrooms that match their identities. But Republican lawmakers say that ordinance created safety issues by giving men, including sex offenders, access to women's bathrooms. In a statement, McCrory said that the basic, ex the basic expectation of privacy in the most personal of settings, a restroom or locker room for each gender, was violated by government overreach and intrusion by the mayor and city council of Charlotte. The bill passed in both chambers. When you look around your congregation on Sunday, chances are there are more women in the service than men, something right in line with the findings of a new study. Charlene Aaron has the story. Women are more religious than men. That's according to the Gender Gap in Religion study by the Pew Research Center. It found that 84% of women from around the world identify with a faith group, compared with 79.9% of men. This devotion is despite the fact that in many religions and denominations, women do not hold positions of power. The criteria used for the study included attendance at services of worship and frequency of prayer. And Christian women were more likely to attend religious services than men. For example, the hit movie War Room was based on the prayer life of two women. Lord, call us to battle. And Bishop T.D. Jakes rose to fame in part because of his Woman Thou Art Loosed ministry. However you define me, whoever you think I was, I am not that person anymore. I am going through a metamorphosis. Is there a changed woman in the house? It seems that way in scripture too. The Bible says that the first person to see Jesus after his resurrection was a woman, Mary Magdalene. Here in the U.S., 64% of women and 47% of men say they pray daily. In France, only 15% of women and 9% of men pray daily. The only religions where men tend to be more devout than women are Islam and Orthodox Judaism. In both faiths, men are more likely to attend religious services than women. So why are women generally more religious than men? Some of the reasons include biology, psychology, family environment, and social status, as women tend to be more open about sharing personal problems and are more relational than men. And for what it's worth, it seems women are well on their way to winning the battle in the arena of prayer and religion. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. For the first time in four years, the Chinese Communist Party gathered in Beijing to discuss the country's direction. Chinese Christians see the meeting as an opportunity to seek God's intervention to guide the world's largest nation. Meng Fai Li has the story. Chinese Christians are getting fired up for Christ. Recently, many Chinese believers traveled to Beijing to get together for one purpose, a Jesus celebration. It comes as anxiety grows about the country's unpredictable economy and as the Communist Party gathers in the capital city to finalize a new budget. Christians gathered to pray for government leaders and their nation. Believers in Beijing organize an exciting and vibrant worship service. Through the singing of worship songs, they ask the Holy Spirit to help Chinese officials understand the urgency of changing China into a Christian nation. Some of the believers even invited non-Christian friends to join them. 
they believe it is time to introduce more Chinese to Christ. I am happy to be here with my friends. I don't know a lot about Jesus. I didn't know what to expect before I came. My friend told me it would be good for me in my life, but I just felt peace as soon as I started to sing along with the songs. Besides singing, the worship leaders invited the attendees to pray passionately for each other. They also talked about the power of praying with one another. This is the critical moment for our nation. We need to pray for our leaders. They need to understand faith is all we need. Believing in Jesus is good for us and the nation. I know God is listening to our prayers all the time. Chinese Christians will continue to organize worship services at various locations throughout the year. They are praying the Holy Spirit will touch more unbelievers, especially among government leaders. Most importantly, they know miracles will happen through the uniting power of Christ. Meng Fei Li for CBN News. Coming up, Easter is a big day for going to church, but for people living in a rural England area, this might be the last holiday spent with a place to hold services. We're going to show you why. Despite facing serious cultural opposition in modern America from anti-religious sentiments and secularism, Christians still view their faith as a force for good in today's world. That is the finding by the Barna Group for David Kinnaman's new book called Good Faith. The research found many believe they are misunderstood, persecuted, and marginalized. Barna survey, the, surveyed the broadest segment of practicing Christians, including evangelicals, Catholics, and mainline churchgoers. And despite the opposition they often face, they say they believe their faith is, quote, a primarily positive contribution to society. Well, this is Passion Week, and Christians around the world are preparing for Easter. But some believers in rural England are wondering if their churches will be holding services next year because of their shrinking congregations. Now there are new plans to save these historic buildings and to help make the church the center of the community once again. John Jessup brings us the story now from Petersburg Church, from Peter Church in England. Tucked away in England's magnificent landscape lies the small village of Peter Church. At the annual Crafts Fair, the Anglican Church bustles with activity, but this kind of church could become an endangered species, in part because of changing demographics as people migrate to the city. A Church of England report shows more than half of its churches are in rural areas, although only 17% of the population lives there. This means smaller congregations, fewer resources, and a bleak future given the average age of attendees hovers around 55. A lot of it is about the demographics, but also, you know, we have to be realistic, secularization amongst the indigenous population. There's no two ways about that. In the diocese serving Herefordshire, England's most sparsely populated county, there are over 400 Anglican churches. Most hundreds of years old, historic landmarks worth saving. The report offers some proposals, such as festival churches, which would only open on special days like Christmas and Easter. Closing, locking that door for the bulk of the year will be a sad day. However, one has to be realistic and looking at the other way, it's jolly hard to keep, maintain, uh, pay the bills on historic buildings. This 3,000-year-old yew tree has certainly seen a lot of change over the years in this English village, and its church, dating back to the 8th century, has found a way to keep up with the changing times. When this church was built, this area would have belonged to the people uh, of the village. So this was the centre of the community. We've lost that over the years, and the church has become more and more a sort of sacred space only, though only the special few can go into. That is what we are trying to reverse. The answer came from the government and an opportunity to use the church's size to help with its Every Child Matters program. But there would need to be an extensive makeover. The inside of the church was quite cold and damp and dark and not very uplifting. Their mission, update the church while keeping its history. A four-year process led to an award-winning design welcoming villagers for more than church services. 
But our architect said, stand in the middle of the nave and turn and look at the new section. That's the vision of the future, but it's very important to still turn and look to the traditional part of the church and marry the two together in the middle. The beauty of the church was maintained. It's sort of ancient beauty and then there's a sort of contemporary beauty as well. There were one or two perhaps who still would rather the pews, but um, in the main, people have just seen that, that instead of it being used for an hour on a Sunday morning, it's now used right through each and every day. St. Peter's Centre offers everything from senior events to yoga classes, and the bell tower now doubles as a branch of the local library. Oh, it's brilliant. Yeah, at the moment, the, um, the main library in, in the city is closed for refurbishment or something. So the fact that we've got a county library in the village and yet in the city they haven't got it at the moment, it's amazing. When craft vendor Caroline Gilbert moved her young family here, St. Peter's caught her attention with its parent toddler group. It's a beautiful building and for a bit small village that takes half an hour to get to a big town, uh, it's great to have, have the facilities. When we reopened, one of the children was out in the uh, playing field out there and said to some other kids, come into our church, it's great. I think it's basically much more welcoming now. While the Church of England acknowledges there's no one-size-fits-all solution, they see St. Peter's as a model of success, making the future brighter than before. John Jessup, CBN News, in Peter Church, England. Our special report, Homosexuality, a Christian View, continues today. We hear from Christians who struggle with same-sex attraction. The story's next. In this latest edition of this CBN News special report, Homosexuality, a Christian View, we talk to Christians who struggle with same-sex attraction. Due to the so-called culture wars, many of these believers find themselves in a no-man's land, unwanted by both the gay and Christian communities, and living in secrecy. I came to the study of these biblical passages about homosexuality and biblical sexuality more broadly as someone who myself uh, realized during puberty that I was attracted to the same sex. To hit middle school, sixth grade, and start having same-sex attractions was just very confusing because I had, had accepted the Lord when I was a little girl. I had begun dealing with same-sex interactions from the time I was like six years old on. I was reared in the church, and so I was full of guilt and shame. How do I grapple with my Christian faith? What view of these texts do I come from that won't just condemn me to live with total shame? I just kind of retreated inside of myself. I wouldn't tell anybody. By the time I was 12, I was an alcoholic and suicidal. When I was 17, I almost died from alcohol poisoning. A lot of late nights spent drinking coffee with my Christian friends, wrestling with these things, crying over these things, praying about these things. After years of, of crying and asking the Lord to take it away, and He never did, I got angry at Him and said, if you're not going to help me, then I, you know, must have been born this way, and I can't fight it anymore, and I just went into the lifestyle. There's the tendency for the gay person to be marginalized in the church. Often the result is, is a profound loneliness. Years later, God showed me what I had done, and I repented of that. After several years, it, it just, I was restless again. I was missing God. Church began to put forward support groups. I found a home group that I sat down with the leader and said, look, this is what I struggle with. Can I come? I was able to divulge without feeling I was going to be cast out or uh, rejected. The things that had happened to me and people began to minister the love of God to me. Christians who allowed me the space to wrestle honestly before God with these questions and who loved me in the midst of my confusion. They didn't condemn me. They didn't judge me. And what I found out too was they loved and respected me. 
And I started to experience a genuine, authentic love that was so much richer than the love I was receiving from the lifestyle. There was a person that I knew loved me and, and I proposed. And like a fool, she accepted. And uh, um, we are still married, by the way. Others of us have pursued a similar path and we have experienced no real change in our sexual orientation. And so for us, uh, the question has been, what might faithful, joyful, hospitable celibacy look like uh, in obedience to Christ? And that's really been my path. It's brothers and sisters in Christ, loving each other, supporting each other, helping each other. My identity is not in who I am with, and, and who I love here, my identity is in Jesus Christ. For the entire special and other resources, visit cbnnews.com slash Christian View. Stay with us. We're coming right back. CBN's orphan promise is helping children in Ukraine stay warm during the country's harsh winter. Orphan's promise recently gave coats and boots to more than 200 children who attended school in the Roma community in western Ukraine, where temperatures can dip as low as 20 below zero. And after receiving their new winter clothing, the children were able to enjoy a fun afternoon playing in the snow, all while keeping warm. You can find out more about what Operation Blood or CBN is doing around the world by logging on to CBN.com slash international. That is going to do it for this edition of CBN News Watch. Remember, you can get more of our exclusive coverage of the issues you care most about at CBNNews.com. We'd love to hear what you think about the stories you've seen here today. You can do it on Facebook or at CBN News on Twitter. Have a good Friday and a happy Resurrection Sunday. We'll see you right back here on Monday.